Leviticus chapter 2 is our text this morning. We're just beginning a new series through the book of Leviticus. And excited to hear uh, in our parallel reading from Hebrews about, you know, we see the fulfillment of God's, uh, of God's promises there in Hebrews. And now we get a closer look at the shadows, as it were, of the text here in Leviticus that we might see Christ in his glory, even as he's presented under the old covenant. So if you would give attention with me to Leviticus chapter 2. It's 16 verses. I will read them all, and then I'll pray for us and ask God's blessing upon our time this morning. Hear the word of the Lord. When anyone brings a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour. He shall, he shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it and bring it to Aaron's sons, the priest. And he shall take from it a handful of the fine flour and oil with all of its frankincense. And the priest shall burn this as its memorial portion on the altar, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. But the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and his sons. It is a most holy part of the Lord's food offerings. When you bring a grain offering baked in the oven as an offering, it shall be unleavened loaves of fine flour mixed with oil or unleavened wafers smeared with oil. And if your offering is a grain offering baked on a griddle, it shall be a fine flour unleavened mixed with oil. You shall break it in pieces and pour oil on it. It is a grain offering. And if your offering is a grain offering cooked in a pan, it shall be made of fine flour with oil. And you shall bring the grain offering that is made of these things to the Lord. And when it is presented to the priest, he shall bring it to the altar. And the priest shall take from the grain offering its memorial portion and burn this on the altar, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. But the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and his sons. It is a most holy part of the Lord's food offerings. No grain offering that you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. For you shall burn no leaven nor any honey as a food offering to the Lord. As an offering of first fruits, you may bring them to the Lord, but they shall not be offered on the altar for a pleasing aroma. You shall season all your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. If you offer a grain offering of first fruits to the Lord, you shall offer for the grain offering of your first fruits fresh ears roasted with fire, crushed new grain. And you shall put oil on it and lay frankincense on it. It is a grain offering. And the priest shall burn as its memorial portion some of the crushed grain and some of the oil with all of its frankincense. It is a food offering to the Lord. Let's pray together this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you that you have spoken to us in it. Lord, I pray that you would speak now by your Holy Spirit. Help us to see Christ in these words. Help us to see Christ, Lord, that we might delight in the bread who has come down from heaven, that we might have everlasting life, that we might be satisfied forevermore. The bread who is broken for us, that we might be made whole. Lord, I ask that your words will be heard this morning and not my own, that you receive all the glory. In the name of Christ, I ask these things. Amen. Last week, I was at the grocery store, and I was buying groceries for the week ahead. And I made that mistake that I'm sure many of you have made in this room, that I went to the grocery store when I was very hungry. And I brought a helper with me to the grocery store that day, and he also was very hungry. And you know what happens when a couple of hungry people go to the grocery store? You buy stuff you didn't intend to buy. And so there we were, just beginning our escapade into the produce section, and my helper looked at this bag of garlic knots. And he picked them up and he said, can we have these? And I didn't even think and said, yes, of course we can. I didn't know what was on the menu for the coming week, but I knew that garlic knots would make it better. They seem to make about everything better. And that's because a meal is not really all the way complete unless there's some kind of bread involved. And that's not just an American thing. That's all across 
every culture. Every culture has some kind of bread, some kind of flour, some kind of grain that's associated with eating of the meal. Go anywhere in the world and you will find that bread is a part of the cuisine and a part of the hospitality of that culture. Let's consider the important role that bread plays in the Christian life. A biblical theology of bread, as it were. Lunch is on its way. It's coming soon. All right. When the people of Israel wandered in the wilderness, what did God give to them? Every day when they woke up, there was fresh bread, manna on the ground, provided for them every single day. It was a consistent part of Israel's life. When they ate bread, they would be reminded of how God provided for them manna in the wilderness. Fast forward to the New Testament and you see Jesus with his disciples, 5,000 of them out in the desert. And what happens? There is nothing for them to eat. So what does Jesus do? He takes a few loaves of bread and he multiplies it enough to feed 5,000 people. A reminder that God always provides exactly what his people need. And then consider the night before Jesus is crucified. What does he do? He takes the bread and he breaks it. And he says, this is my body broken for you. And so today, when we worship God, we cannot do it without noticing the significance of bread. And yet when Jesus is tempted by the devil in the wilderness, what does he say? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So every time you eat bread, you need to be reminded that God has given you that bread. That's really what's going on here in Leviticus chapter 2. What we see in our text today is described as the grain offering. That's an offering that's brought in from the fields. It's harvested from stalks of grain, beaten down into flour, or baked into some kind of specific bread. But the goal this morning is not really to understand exactly how we're supposed to prepare our bread for our meals. Leviticus 2 is not an instruction manual. Rather, Leviticus chapter 2 is a reminder that we need to bring ourselves to God, recognizing that he is the God who has given us everything that we have. When we thank God for our bread, when we thank God for the food on our tables, we are really recognizing the kind of God that he is. We are worshiping God for providing for us. The main idea in our text is this, that we praise God by recognizing who he is. The the grain offering is not really about bread, It's about God. It's about the kind of God that gives to his people everything that they need. The grain offering in chapter two follows on the heels of the burnt offering in chapter one. It's a different kind of offering. It's a gift. The text calls it a memorial offering. Whereas the burnt offering symbolizes being freed from God's wrath, the grain offering seems to imply that the worshipers are now walking in God's covenant pleasure as his people. It's an offering of thankfulness. That means that the God who is good enough to atone for the sins of his people is also good enough to provide for his people. The fact that this, these regulations and this offering are contained in Leviticus chapter 2 leads us to consider that this offering is likely offered immediately after the burnt offering. So after the Israelite has brought the expensive bull or the the sheep from the flock or the, the, the two birds, the Israelite would turn around and then offer this offering of thanksgiving to the Lord. Thank you for providing for me all of my needs. Andrew Bonar says it like this. He says, when he had by the burnt offering obtained the full acceptance for his soul, he comes next to give up his whole substance to the Lord who has redeemed him. The mercies of God constrain him to give up all that he has to the Lord. Just as a steak dinner seems incomplete without a dinner roll or some kind of bread to accompany it, the burnt offering for atonement without offering all of yourself to the Lord also seems like a blatant contradiction. That is, God does not just desire that we ask for forgiveness of sins. He also desires that we give all of ourselves to him in light of his forgiving of our sins. 
What we see in the grain offering is simply a glimpse of what kind of God we serve and the reason why we should wholeheartedly worship him. Notice four points in our text about the character and the nature of our God. Number one, that God is to be praised because he is a provider. Just like our text last week, we see that there's one grain offering, but there are several different ways to offer this grain offering. First, the worshiper could take the finest flour, the best flour that he had, and give this to the Lord to bring it to the offering, mixed with oil, yet not baked into bread. Second, the worshiper could bring flour that had been baked or, or cooked into some specific type of unleavened bread. There's three types of this here. This bread could be uh, baked, it could be bread that's cooked on a griddle like a pancake, or it could be bread that was cooked in a pan. And these offerings were always given in conjunction with a burnt offering or a fellowship offering. Perhaps every single time a burnt offering was made. So it appears that whether you are offering uncooked flour or, or bread that has been cooked, what you are to do with the offering is essentially the same. Part of it is to be taken out and burned on the altar and the rest to be given to the priest. Why does, is part of the offering taken out and burned? Well, the text tells us in verse number two. Look at it with me. And he shall take from it a handful of fine flour and oil with all of its frankincense, and the priest shall burn this as its memorial portion on the altar. A food offering with a pleasing, uh, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. The text tells us exactly why this was to be done. Why was the the portion of the offering separated and burned on the altar. Well, it was a memorial. The word memorial in the Hebrew text is derived from the word to remember. Remember what? What is this a memorial for? Well, I think it's a, it's a reminder to remember where your food has come from, to remember who it is that has caused the stalks of grain in your field to grow, to remind you who it is that puts the bread on your table, so to speak. It's the Lord. It is God who has provided for his people. You might recall, as I mentioned earlier, that there was a time when Israel went hungry in the wilderness and had no bread. You can read through Exodus after they've crossed the Red Sea. The Israelites thought they were going to die in the wilderness. In fact, they wanted to go back to Egypt because they were so hungry. And they said to Moses and grumbled and complained, Moses, when we were in Egypt, we had bread. We had meat and you've led us out here in the wilderness to die. And what does God do? Well, God shows that he is always able to provide for his people by sending manna every single day. Every single morning, God provided fresh bread for the people of Israel. And they could wake up and collect as much as they needed to get through that day. Every single day, friends, God feeds you. Maybe you do the cooking in your household Maybe your spouse does. Maybe you're not that great of a cook. Maybe you wish you were better. But just recognize, if you're here today, it's because God has fed you every day of your life to get you to this point. It's not, you're not self-sufficient. You are dependent upon the Lord. And he is good enough to not just give us sustenance, but to give us delicious food day by day by day that we might see of his goodness and so there is this memorial that happens in Leviticus chapter 2, taking a portion of what God has given you and burning it as a way to say, thank you, Lord, for providing for me and my family every single day. The Lord delights to show himself faithful in providing for his people. I don't know what you had to eat yesterday. It was Saturday. Maybe it was your cheat day. Maybe you ate really well yesterday. Uh, maybe you didn't. Maybe you ate leftovers from the week. But whatever you had to eat yesterday, God provided it for you. Every single breath you've taken to this point in your life, God has given you that, the oxygen in your lungs, as it were. The grain offering was one way the people of God expressed their devotion to the Lord. By giving of their grain, by giving of their bread, giving it to the Lord, they were saying, thank you, Lord, for providing for me all that I have, all that I have and all that I need. And so it is for Christian. You know, the Christian life is a wholehearted trust in the providence of God. That we are all learning day by day to cast ourselves wholly upon the providence of God. 
to trust that God is able to provide for us. Are you ever anxious? Are you ever anxious about how you're going to make ends meet, as it were, anxious about the expenses, anxious about the cares and the affairs of this world? Well, really, as Christians, we don't need to be because God is a faithful provider. This is what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In Leviticus 2, the worshipers are to bring their offering to the Lord out of the ground, not in anxiety, not saying, well, I, I, I really can't give of my grain this week because I have, it hasn't yielded that much, so I need to keep some, I need to keep this offering back for myself. No, you were, you were commanded by God, bring your grain, bring of the bread that God has given of you to eat for this week and trust that he's gonna give it to you again next week. Bring of what God has given to you day by day and trust. Trust the Lord more than you trust yourself. I mean, good grief. If I trusted myself all the time for everything, I wouldn't be standing up here today. You likely could say the same. But we can trust the Lord. He doesn't change. There is no shadow of turning with him. He will provide for his people. Christian, you can trust your God. You could trust him completely. Whatever that thing is that you're worried about this morning, you could trust him with it. He will provide. He is faithful. Notice another way he provides in this text. The provision baked into this text is the provision for the priest. Look at verse three. But the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and his sons. It is a most holy part of the Lord's food offerings. The first part of this offering is burnt on the altar. But you notice that the other portion is given to the priests. If you recall, when the people of Israel are divvying out the land, when they're they're divvying out the Holy Land and seeing which tribe is going to dwell in which place, the tribe of Levi is given no land. That means they have no fields to plow. They have no opportunity to harvest grain for themselves. So how does God provide for the Levites? How does God provide for the priests? Well, the people of God provide for the people of God. It's a wonderful provision God has worked into this text here. That as the people of God, as the tribes of Israel bring their offering to the Lord, that God feeds his priests by that very offering. It's an amazing thing, really. The way God provided for the Levites is through his people bringing their offerings to him. And there's a clear application in the New Testament that those who minister the gospel are to be provided by those who they minister to. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 13. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple, uh, in the temple service, get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Notice, Paul wants to make this clear He's not telling the church in Corinth that this is his idea. He wants the church in Corinth to know this is God's idea. That gospel ministers are to, are to be fed, are to make their living by ministering the gospel. So I want to say thank you. Because this church has been so kind to me and to my family. Um, that I, just God has overwhelmingly blessed us through this body, Creekside Fellowship. So I want to say thank you, that one of the blessings of God's providence is that one of the ways he most often cares for his people 
is through his body. One of the ways God most often manifests his love for you, Christian, is by the faithfulness of other Christians in your life. Isn't that true? When you're sick and someone brings you a meal, when you're needy and someone helps you, when you have car trouble and you call someone to help, isn't it such a kind thing for God to bless his people by giving his people his body, by belonging to a part of the body of Christ? I've surely been a beneficiary of that, so I wanna say thank you. And likely you have been a beneficiary as well of the, the love that the people of Creekside have for God and for one another. God in his wisdom had ordained a way where the priest served as the people worshiped. And because the priest was able to serve, the people were able to worship. You had to have a priest and the priest had to get fed somehow. And God in his wisdom ordained that the way the priest would be fed and provided for was by the very worship of the people. It's a beautiful picture we see there in the first couple of verses of Leviticus of the way God provides for his people. But notice that's just one part of what's going on with the grain offering. It's not just a declaration that God is able to provide, but also a declaration that God is holy. Second in our text, that God is to be praised because he is holy. Look at verse number 11 with me. It says, no grain offering that you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven, for you shall burn no leaven nor any honey as a food offering to the Lord. Come on, leaven is what makes the bread good. You know, leaven's what makes it like, you know, moist and, and fat and you want to eat gobs and gobs and gobs of it, right? Why no leaven? Why no honey? It's a strange thing, isn't it? Isn't, aren't these, don't these things make the bread more delicious? We might say, yes, they do, but they're not to be offered in the burnt offering. Why is that? Or in the grain offering? There's several different reasons that have been given by various commentators. Some would say leaven is forbidden because leaven is a living thing and only dead things are to be offered on the altar. There might be some validity in that point, but it's unclear from the text if that's the reason why. Others have said that leaven symbolizes corruption. But if you read verse 12, you see that leaven is not always forbidden. It can be offered in first fruits. It can be offered in a different kind of offering, just not in this particular offering. Some have suggested that honey is forbidden because pagans used honey whenever they sacrificed to their false gods. But pagans also sacrificed cows to their false gods. So it doesn't seem to be a consistent point there. It does not appear from the text that leaven or honey is necessarily evil. So I think the best reason we can understand why leaven or honey is forbidden in this offering is because that's what God said. And that should be enough, right? When God says something, that should be enough for his people to say, that's right. We need not try to be wiser than the Lord. The reason God forbids these things from being offered is because God is holy. He is distinct. And so he wants his people to be holy and distinct. You think about it, when the Israelites would eat their bread at home, they were free to eat it with leaven. They were free to eat it with honey. But when they brought this bread, when they brought this grain to the Lord, they were forbidden to put these substances in it. The goal of the offering was not to prepare something that they would find pleasing, but to prepare something that God would find pleasing. And so the Israelites were to consider how they might order their lives in such a way as to please the Lord. Andrew Bonar again comments on this. He says, we must like Christ be the Lord's holy and separate from the world, not pleasing ourselves. I think it's important to remember that those things which might be common or impressive to the world are not impressive to the Lord. I mean, honey and leaven, they make bread better, right? Well, maybe from our perspective, but not in God's sight. God's standards are not the world's standards. The things that are sweetest in God's sight are often sour in the world's sight. I mean, just think about it for a moment. God delights in Christian marriage and the world scorns it. God delights in sexual purity and the world mocks it. God delights in temperance and moderation and the world lives in outrage and excess. God desires patience and the world craves immediacy. God desires peace, 
And the world creates conflict. In the Christian life, there ought to be a clear distinction between the Christian and the world. Your schedule should be different than the world's. Your language should be different than the world's. The way you spend your money and the way you count things as valuable should be different than the world's. Does this mean it was a sin to eat honey or to eat leaven? Absolutely not. But it was a sin to offer these things to the Lord because God wanted an unmixed and pure offering. Can we ever be totally pure before the Lord? Absolutely not. In discussing the purity of the offering, there's a clear analogy here to the Lord Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ was God and man, and yet just as the offering had to be without leaven, Jesus Christ was the bread of heaven without sin. That he was totally and completely pure before the Lord. You and I could never offer a pure offering to the Lord. All of our best deeds are stained with sin and worldliness, but Jesus Christ He is completely righteous, completely without sin. The only way we will ever be righteous is if we are found in Christ. Christ is our only hope to be pleasing before a God who delights in holiness. So if you desire to be holy as your Lord is holy, you must first look not at yourself, but to your Savior. He has been holy in your stead that you might walk in holiness as you follow after him. The removal of honey and and leaven from the sacrifice shows us the necessity for God's people to be holy. And it points to Christ's ability to provide precisely what God requires, which is holiness. Consider also how Jesus is foreshadowed in this text in the language of covenant. Notice the third point in our text, that God is to be be praised because of his glorious covenant. Verse 13 mentions salt three times. Every offering that was given was to involve salt. Why? Why is there salt in the offering? Well, salt was a preservative in those days. It kept things from decaying and from going bad. The fear was not that the bread was going to go bad. It was freshly baked, probably that morning before they brought it to the altar. No, the the idea here is that when salt preserves, just as salt preserves the food, God would preserve his people. That just as the salt would stop the decay from happening, God, through his covenant, would sustain his people. This is what Gordon Wenham says about this. To add salt to the offering was a reminder that the worshiper was in an eternal covenant relationship with his God. This meant that God would never forsake him. And also that the worshiper had a perpetual duty to uphold and keep the covenant law. The idea of this covenant was central to the people of God. In fact, Leviticus is a covenantal document. It is not meant for those who are outside of the covenant, but meant for those specifically who are a part of God's precious covenant that he made with Abraham. Now, consider verse 13 again. You shall season all your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Why must the salt be offered with the offering of flour? Because God has made a covenant with his people and he wants to remind his people of his promises every single time they come to worship him. Every single time they come to offer something upon the altar, God wants to remind them of his love, of his faithfulness, of his promises. Every single time, He wants his people to know the glory of this promise that he has made. Let's be reminded, friends, what good news this covenant is. The covenant that God made with Abraham was that the Messiah would come from his family lineage, that Abraham and his descendants would become a great nation, that they would inherit the promised land. And all throughout the Old Testament, you see this covenant unfolding. And here's the good news. The promises of the covenant, they are not fleeting or passing. They are sure. God has made decrees from eternity past and they are sure to come to past. So each time that salt was sprinkled upon the altar, the people of God were reminded that their God had made a covenant with them and he was going to keep it. 
And they were to be faithful to their God by keeping the covenant themselves. Notice this is an area where the understanding of bread and of covenant should cause us to pause. Because the night before Jesus died, he held up the bread and he broke it. And he said, take and eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks for it, he gave it to them all saying, drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. You see, in reminding the people of the covenant in the sprinkling of salt, there's a foreshadowing of the new covenant that would one day come in Jesus Christ where his blood would be poured out for the sins of his people. Jesus is the bread broken for us that we might know what it is to be in a covenant relationship with our God. The bread that was offered on the altar as a memorial offering to God as a remi- was a reminder that God would be faithful and was also pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. And pointed to the fact that the Lord Jesus would be faithful. And so, might I encourage you with this application today. Remember God's covenant. When you come into this room week by week to worship, remember God's covenant promises to you. When you take the bread and the cup, remember the new covenant. Remember what God has promised to you. Just as the Lord did not want his people to offer this grain offering without remembering his covenant, God does not desire for his people to come and worship him without remembering this glorious covenant that he has made with us, the glorious promises that he has lavished upon us in the new covenant. And let me just remind you what the promises of the new covenant are. In Jeremiah 31, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with with their fathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. Brother, sister, each week as you remember God's covenant to you, remember that God does not remember your sins anymore. When the old covenant saints came and brought their bread and their salt They remembered the covenant promises that God had made and they hoped that the promises would come true. And so as we take the bread and the cup each week, we remember the covenant God has made with us and how he has kept his promises to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And friend, doesn't that give you bright hope for tomorrow? Doesn't that give you strength for today to to know and to hope that just as God has been faithful in the past, because he doesn't change He will be faithful forevermore and he will be faithful to you. We are free to follow and to worship God because he is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. But it points to a fourth point in our text. That God is to be praised because he is self-sufficient. This is a wonderful thing to meditate on. There seems to be an interjection at the end of the chapter. Notice the structure with me. Look at verse one. And notice the word that it starts with, when. Look at verse four and notice the word that it starts with, when. Look at verse 14 and notice the word that it starts with, if. There's a difference between when and if. When is an expectation, you you must do this. If is a conditional statement, isn't it? If the conditions are right, you must do this. It's a conditional offering. It comes at a certain time of year given certain circumstances. And what is this conditional offering called? It's called the offering of first fruits. Much of the details following the offering are the same, but notice the timing of it. This offering is not demanded, it is voluntary. The first fruits offering was the offering at the beginning of the harvest season. So as you have planted your grain and as... As you have waited and waited and waited and waited and finally your grain is ready to be harvested, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to harvest that grain and not go home and break delicious bread with it. 
You're supposed to harvest that grain, that first fruit from the ground and go and take it to the Lord. And to say, God has provided this grain for me. This was to be a reminder to the people of Israel that even though the seasons change, even though there are seasons of plenty and seasons of less, God does not change. Louis Burkhoff, theologian, says this. He says, as the self-existent God, he is not only independent in himself, but also causes everything to depend on him. It is only as the self-existent and independent one that God can give the assurance that he will remain eternally the same in relation to his people. For a more elementary expression of this truth, we might say it like this, that God is good all the time and all the time God is good. This is a reminder to the Israelites. It's, It's a reminder to us that God is not dependent upon us. And we are totally dependent upon him. Even if the harvest was a great harvest and it would feed the people for a long time, they were to bring the the first fruits of that harvest and bring it to the Lord. And even if that harvest was meager and they wondered how it would sustain them, they were to bring that harvest to the Lord. We change. God does not. And the offering of the first fruits is a reminder of that fact. And so when the people of Israel brought their first fruit offering, it was a declaration that they wanted to be faithful to the Lord in every season. And yet their very ability to bring this kind of offering was dependent upon the Lord to cause the grass to grow as it were. It's a glorious thing. It's a wonderful thing to be totally dependent on a God who is totally independent. What does God need in order to be God? Nothing. We don't have to give God a single thing in order for him to be God. He is just God. And yet what do we need in order to exist as human beings? Oh, we are remarkably needy, aren't we? We have to be fed and watered every few hours or we get cranky. This is a quality in God that theologians call aseity. This means that God requires nothing to be God and exist in and of himself. That God is not like us. What a wonderful truth that is. That God is, de- is not dependent and God does not change. Sometimes I think we have this conception in our mind that God is like us, just bigger and better. But friends, God is wholly unlike us in this respect, that he will never stop being God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. As that song we sang earlier said so well, there is no shadow of turning with him. The offering at the feast of the first fruits was not given because God was hungry and needed something. No, it was given because we are hungry and we need something. It's not because God is dependent upon us because we are wholly dependent upon God. The psalmist captures the idea in this way. In Psalm 50, 12 and 13, the Lord is speaking through the psalmist and says this, if I were hungry, I would not tell you for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? You see, here's the remarkable difference between the worship of the God of Israel and the worship of the rest of the pagan gods of Israel's day. All of the pagans worshipped their God because they thought their God needed something. They, their God needed bread or their God needed grain or needed something in order to appease them. But the God of Israel, what does he need? Absolutely nothing. And this is a free will kind of offering. We can freely give to the Lord, not because he is needy, but because we are needy. And so we can cast ourselves wholly upon him. The grain offering is a picture of a life wholly devoted to the Lord. When the Israelites brought that first fruit at the beginning of the harvest season, they were reminded of the fact that God has no seasons. He simply is. And isn't a God like that worthy to be worshipped? In chapter 1, we considered how the burnt offering was a picture of atonement for sinners. In chapter 2, we we consider how the grain offering is a picture of wholehearted surrender to the Lord. Lord, everything I have belongs to you. 
from the bulls in my herd to the the bread on my table, Lord, it first and foremost comes from you. Leviticus 1 depicts Christ as Savior. Leviticus 2 depicts Christ as Lord. If you and I were to leave here and to go to a five-star steak restaurant with the best cuts of meat imaginable, even if the steak was amazing, if there was no bread, we might be a little disappointed. We might think that this meal is a little bit incomplete, that there's something lacking. So it should be strange in the church if we see Christians proclaiming Christ as their substitute, pleading his blood on their behalf, and yet failing to devote every area of their lives to him. You don't go to the steakhouse for bread, but you expect it to be there. Well, you don't come to the church to look for good deeds, but you expect them to be there. It's part of what it means to be a Christian. We expect good deeds to accompany the preaching of Christ and him crucified. It's the outworking of the gospel. That's really what we see in Leviticus chapter 2. As we are accepted before God, we bring our worship to him that it might be accepted before God. We bring every area of our lives to him. So let me conclude with this question. If you are a Christian, is there an area of your life that remains undevoted to the Lord? Your finances, your schedule, your forms of entertainment, your work. Let Leviticus 2 be a reminder to you. You can devote yourself wholeheartedly to the Lord and not be anxious even for a moment. For the Lord our God is faithful to provide for his people. Not only does he provide for our physical needs and the bread on our tail, but he provides everything we need for life and godliness by sending his son in our stead, the faithful savior, Jesus Christ. The faithfulness of God never ceases. And if you question that, look to the cross and see That God has not just given you bread on your table, but he has given you the bread that has come down from heaven that you might taste and be satisfied and have eternal life. This God is worthy to be praised.